All right, here we are, another episode of Coffee with the Founder. Got my coffee cup. Got my I coffee. don't have my <laughs> I don't have my coffee. I have my mason jar filled with water. <laughs> That's old school right there. So we got a we got another great uh, guest here. We do by said uh, we do we're doing these coffee talks to try to introduce people to the WPC family. And so um, uh, this is an opportunity to let people know about not only the work you do when you're speaking from the stage or speaking in workshops, but what's the work you do long after the conference. So we're glad you're here. Let's start just by asking you, who are you and what do you do? So good. Thank you. And hello to you, Eddie. Hello to the WPC family. I love you all. Uh, miss you all. I wish we were seeing you and mess up, but next year, yay for 2021. Can't wait to check you all then. So, uh, so who am I? Um, such a, you know, that question, like talk about it, like a, a massive spiritual question. So I, um, when I think about that question, I think about how the most important thing to me is I'm a citizen of this world. I am a woman, a woman of color, a woman of color whose heart beats to the drum of wanting to create systems change in our society. But I view it as my mission in life to create a more equi equitable world for all. In particular, I'm deeply interested in interrupting all forms of uh, supremacy that in permeate our, our society. For a living, I do this, as you know. So I'm a equity, diversity, and inclusion speaker, author, consultant. I live in Toronto, Canada, but I work globally to make this happen. And in particular, the domain that I focus on is the workplace. And so I spend a lot of time with organizations around how do you create more inclusive workplaces, equitable workplaces, so that all of us have the ability to thrive. Yeah, well, I want to ask you a little bit more about the state of the workplace today. But before I do that, I want to ask you, I mean, did you grow up thinking, hey, someday I'm going to be a global speaker, <laughs> changing organizations across the world? I mean, how did you get to this point? Yeah, such a good question. Like, I often will say, like, when I was, uh, like, 20 years old, so this is, like, 25 years ago when I was 20 years old, if you had said to me, like, Ritu, you know this critical race theory that you are studying, like Audrey Lord and, and all the other greats that you are studying? One day, people are going to pay you to come into their workplaces and deconstruct their systems around what they're doing that is causing the oppression and marginalization of certain cultural communities. I would just like, like knock me over with a feather if that will happen, but here we are, like, right? Uh, I, I knew at a young age, I'll tell you this, so as a brown girl, a little brown girl growing up in a really homogeneous part of uh, the outside of Toronto, I personally experienced extensive racist uh, childhood bullying. I witnessed my parents who were immigrants to the country from India, and from when I say we're from India, we're Punjabi and we're Sikh. And when I say Sikh, Sikh my faith is called Sikhism. I am a Sikh. My father wears a turban. Um, in my faith, you're not supposed to cut your hair, so a lot of us have um, long, un unshorn hair, although I do cut my hair because I like layers. Although during this COVID environment, I am not really cutting my hair, but anyways, being a good Sikh girl whatever. Um, I, my parents experienced a lot of racism coming to the country. And then also growing up during the 80s, so in 1984, there was state sanctioned genocide of my people in India that, so think about it, 1984, no internet, very um, difficult to, to channel news globally. Uh, we, no one really gave a shit about brown skinned people back then, let alone now, and what's happening in their, in their countries. And so very little atten attention was paid to it globally, but I was around eight years old when that happened and it had a profound impact on me and my spirit. And all I knew from a very young age, like from around the age of seven, eight, and then my experiences with racist childhood bullying and then watching my parents struggle and climb the economic ranks and all of that is that it lit for me a fire that was probably already there, like because I carry a warrior blood through my veins as a sick 
uh, Punjabi princess hailing from Mother India, warrior blood is in me, but it lit the fire around how I wanted to uh, dedicate my life to fighting social injustice. So even in my teen years, like some of the stuff that I would do at high school where, I, where for example, I, I witnessed a lot of LGBTQ oppression and I was like, I went to the principal and I was like, no, as an ally, I didn't know what an ally was back then. I, I, all I, and, and we didn't even call it LGBTQ back then. We, I just said, what is the, the mockery that is being made of people who are gay at the school assemblies is wrong. So I just, I knew at a young age that there was a spirit fire in me that wanted to fight injustice. Did I know that, did I know back then that I would be doing this for a living and I get paid to do this? Hell's effing no. Am I glad that I have built my life around it? Hell's yes, because I will tell you this, all of the research around happiness speaks to having purpose and meaning in life. And when we know what our purpose and meaning is in life and we anchor to it, we feel more grounded and rooted and centered. So even in this moment as like chaos swirls around us, I know what my purpose and meaning is. I'm anchored to it. And because of that, it helps me to feel a bit better. Yeah, yeah. I really want to ask you later about young people that may be experiencing some of what you were fighting against, but also simultaneously experiencing what's your message to them today um, as they search for purpose, search for life, and battle some of the challenges that sometimes, you know, you have to battle just in general in this society, but especially when you come in black and brown skin. But, but before that, before that, let's go back to the work, right? Like, you've been across the world uh, dealing with uh, working with, challenging, learning from, teaching folks in workplaces all over. What, yeah. is, what is really the state of the workplace? How is the workplace doing when it comes to diversity, inclusion, equity from your vantage point? So the, the existence of supremacy gender supremacy, racial supremacy, supremacy based on social, uh, social, or, uh, social class, sexual orientation, religion, and more. All of the stuff we see in society continues to pervade and permeate workplaces. We continue to be in a place where globally, every single place that I have worked in the world, even when these are places where they are predominantly uh, countries of color, because of imperialization and colonization, white supremacy permeates every single system that exists in society. It is there with us in an omnipresent way, the same way that gender supremacy permeates everything that we do, so that that men um, and and maleness uh, is the preferred way of being, given um, uh, priority over being a woman, over coming from the, the uh, trans community and more. And so we live in a society where we're, our workplaces continue to reflect biases, the isms, forms of oppression and marginalization. Now we are seeing some shifts and things are getting somewhat better, but the progress is slow as molasses. And the problem, like if, if I were to get like really direct around this, Eddie, I've been thinking a lot about this in the context of observing what's been happening ar around us being in this COVID environment. And I think the problem is that the intersection between supremacy and capitalism, we live in a society globally now, increasingly even in nations that don't embrace capitalism, directly and speak to it as such, the capitalism pervades everything that we do. And what we don't talk about is how capitalism globally was built on the backs of people of color and built on the back uh, of patriarchy. And so in a globally capitalistic society that benefits from having people be marginalized and oppressed, it benefits from the labor of black and brown skinned people. It benefits from the tax that is put on to, to uh, women and poor people and more uh, ex exploiting labor that it works for capitalism that we uphold these systems. And so while we have made progress, we have a systemic problem at, at, uh, to deal with, to contend with. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, as you know, and I'm sure have experienced what progress means, what progress looks like is very different for very different people all across the world. And we, yeah. may, ne we may never have a, a common answer to how much progress, but I, I think 
I would agree with you. There's been some movement, no doubt. What's interesting for me is throughout society, throughout history, is when we have movement, we have these incidents across the world, possibly, that could derail us. For example, um, uh, uh, 911. I can remember, you know, the towers coming down and how that could impact the way people have to go back to work the next day. Um, I can remember even the OJ trial, right? Like the verdict, right? Impacting the way people have to go back. Uh, Princess Diana even, you know, dying and how people could handle that differently. Shoot, I remember people with Biggie and Tupac, you know, dying, right? <laughs> So, 100%, yes. Right, but right now, we're in the middle of this pandemic. What I was going to ask you is, <laughs> what's your sense of how COVID-19 is going to shift and change the workplace, impact the way people have to experience work when they go back around issues of inclusion, equity, and diversity? Yeah, that's such a big question. Um, I have a few thoughts uh, about this. And, and I share this from the position of we are having this conversation in the thick of us engaging in physical distancing and remote working. So I take note, I'm about to complete tomorrow, it will have been eight weeks of remote working and physical distancing for me. And so it'll be interesting to, to have this be watched when it is watched and what the world will look like then. And so it's kind of like crystal balling, like, am I right? Am I wrong? Let's see, <laughs> what are my predictions like? So, uh, so a few things, uh, first of all, I think that this experience has shown us that any hesitation or resistance to being in a place where we offer the ability to remote work is silly and unfounded because we didn't have a choice but to, come, to be in a place where we have started remote working and many people are finding that they are effectively able to work remotely. Now, now and I say effectively able to work, I, I'd be the first to tell you that my, um, mental health is diminished in this moment because of physical distancing, because of the stress around COVID and so much more, and that this is not the ideal work, way for me to work. But, the, but, but I can, I do get, I'm productive. I'm getting things done and I can, and as someone who is a global pro, a, a professional speaker, I work remotely a lot of the times anyways. I'm like you, Eddie, like I'm literally working from planes and from the airport uh, lounge and from taxis even, or the Uber, or wherever. Like I'm used to working remotely, and so working from my home is doable. So for, for organizations that have resisted having people work remotely, this will be an eye-opening experience, and I suspect that a lot more workplaces will open up the opportunity for people to work uh, remotely at a, at a higher level. So that's one thing, um, the, which is a positive. I think another positive so i'm going with the positive stuff first and then i'm going to get into the dark stuff so the other positive that i see very um much in this moment is how this really hard moment has opened up the uh door to having really sophisticated complex honest vulnerable authentic conversations around mental health so mental health is, is an area of inclusion that we as EDI professionals have been pushing. We want it to be at the forefront. It's been really hard to get people to talk about this in the workplace, even when like, it's like, we'll do our one workshop on mental health and wellness for the year. And like, then we can tick the box and say, we did something on mental health. So good. Whereas now it's like, the overwhelming majority of us have diminished mental health or are men we're experiencing some type of mental health challenges. And it's showing us, it's revealing to us that everyone has mental health, that everyone can have mental health wellness and have unwellness. We're all on a spectrum somewhere. And so being able to talk about this safely, have psychological safety created in workplaces to have these conversations as leaders being in a place where we can lead these conversations in a supportive and inclusive way with our team members is important and so much more. So, so from a mental health inclusion perspective, I think this is a really great moment for us to create cultural change. My fear though, and now we're getting into the dark stuff, is that, well, a few things. First of all, we know from past economic downturns, and we know at the best of times 
the people of color in particular, that we experience less mentorship sponsorship, we get less work opportunities, we experience more biases, it's harder for us to get promoted, it's harder for us to be seen, and so much more. At the best of times, we know from past economic downturns, there's a disproportionate amount of us who are in the pool that gets laid off, laid off let go, terminated. And so I am deeply worried that that same pattern will be reflected here because we are starting about to be in already in the thick of an economic downturn we're like heading into like a massive global recession most likely and people will be adversely impacted in from a workplace perspective let alone in society like you and i could yuck it up at length on how this experience is putting a spotlight on all the inequities that permeate our global society but from a workplace perspective that's my worry it's it's the it's the we have less work to do Who's going to get the work? It's going to be mini me or same person I like. It's going to be the white, straight, able-bodied, cisgender, um, older or younger uh, Christian man. Like it, that's who it's going to be. And the, the people who come from underrepresented communities, marginalized communities, are going to get left behind or going to be let go, quite literally. The other thing that I worry about as it relates to the workplace and society as a whole is this experience of physical distancing is antithetical to how we as human beings like to be. Like We don't like being on our own, cooped up, confined. We need to be in the physical presence of others. We like to co-regulate our nervous systems. We want to be around other people. I worry that this is going to lead to heightened fear, anxiety, and othering. In other words, I think this is going to feed into biases. We're, like even me, like, let's, let's take me as someone who teaches uh, equity, diversity, inclusion for a living. I went to the grocery store. I think it was like maybe three or four weeks ago. I'm, I'm better now. I'm better now, but three or four weeks ago, I went to the grocery store and it's like someone walked into my path at three feet. And I literally was like this. Like, and I looked at them, like I gave them like the look of death. I'm like, what are you doing walking into my, my orbit? Like get thee out of my orbit. Like you're three feet away. Don't you know you're supposed to be six feet away? Is what I'm thinking in my head. But instead all I did is this. And as I walked to the grocery store, I was like, like it's kind of like, like, like a tether ball and trying to swerve the tether ball. Like it's like, so this othering, this, this, this experience of like, don't be around the other because the other might give you COVID is going to have an impact on our on our systems and i worry about how that will feed into biases oh that's so good um i am afraid you may be right three weeks four weeks from now uh i'm hoping you're not but at least it'll give us some sense of what we can be working on and your ending story about the supermarket is so funny because i was walking yesterday and it looked like a grandpa with maybe a two-year-old, maybe one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old, just learning to walk, and white kid, white grandpa, and here's this, you know, towering black guy, and I'm, I'm coming out, and I literally had to, you know, distance, right, physical distance, but I could see the kid wanting to say hello, you know, wanting to, and it's almost like the message I'm giving that I don't want to give is totally opposite to who I am, yet this physical distancing, I think, is going to be having some interesting effects that we may not even be able to record or have a sense of just because people are, in the case of this young kid, not able to communicate what that message is. Or like you said, we're just having so much ball of anxiety that we're just trying to get the hell out of there before we brush up against anyone. A hundred percent. It's it's really actually it's upsetting. And and then so as someone who teaches, um, I also as you know teach mindfulness and empowerment and wellness, integrated into my work around being authentic. Having like, written a book on authenticity and all that, you'll see on like Instagram, I'm constantly storying about this type of stuff and posting about it and all that. Uh, we. Um, in order to be in a place where we don't do the, oh my God, get the hell out of my orbit and, and treat people like they're like, like, like a tetherball, we need to be really in our bodies. Like we need to be in the moment. We need to be present. We need to be embodied, essentially. That is really hard to do when we are feeling fear. It is also really hard to do when all of the systems I feel in this moment are trying to push us back into the workplace and push us back into working and get the economy up and running again and get systems up and running again. And 
And, and I understand why we want to do that. And at the same time, I'm thinking, do we as individuals, do we as collectives, do we as a society have the wherewithal of understanding that in doing this, how do I be as embodied as possible? Because in order to interrupt our biases and to interrupt, interrupt forms of supremacy, interrupt the internalization of bias. So for example, for, pe for people of color, like we, we reflexively get out of the way of white people anyways when they're in our midst to protect them, their nervous systems over ours. How is that even gonna be amplified now? Mm -hmm. Do we have that, are we embodied enough to be regulating around that? So one of the West messages that I'm pushing out as much as possible is be embodied, but be in your body so that you can see like, how am I feeling and how am I treating other people, but how am I treating myself so that I also am not feeling like I am a monster that needs to get out of the way of other people. Mm. It's such an important thing to be doing. Well, I want to come back to uh, your book and how that came about and what you're hoping to accomplish through that publication and the other work associated with that. But before that, I want to give you a chance to talk to some young people because my sense being in a lot of schools that uh, young people are dealing with some of the things that you mentioned that you had to endure, overcome, but also, you know, kind of gather some fire and inspire around. So um, when you talk to young people, um, or if you have a chance uh, now to speak to some young folks who may be passing by their parents' computer or maybe part of the WPC family who are you know, either dealing with some of this stuff or willing to be allies around some of the challenges, the oppression that they're seeing that may be increased due to COVID-19, what's your message to the young people? Yeah. <sighs> so I have lived to tell, you know, I have lived to tell. So I hung in there. I want you to hang in there. My message to you is to hang in there because it does get better. And when I say get better, I was that kid who was really nerdy, really geeky. I was bullied rel relentlessly, like it, physically, emotionally, verbally on a daily basis for years. And I have done so much uh, work. When I say work, I've gone to therapy, I've done group healing work, I've done individual work, I meditate, I pray, I take care of my physical body, my mental um, health and so much more so that I can thrive and I am thriving. And this is what I, when I say I live to tell, you can live to tell. And how do you make that happen? You believe in your goodness, you believe in your, um, your power, you stand in your power, you be who you are. Like one of the things in writing my book about authenticity, and again, I talk about this everywhere um, on across social media is I changed who I was so that people would accept me, but it was a house of cards because any moment that I would be more of who I am, the, the love and affection, the friendship would be taken away and I'd get more bullying. But that was a really uh, damaging way for me to live my life. And it wasn't until I stepped into who I am and I was like, F that noise. I'm gonna do me, be me, speak like me. I'm just gonna put myself out there that I finally started feeling better about myself. And you know, being authentic in who we are is like a magnet. It draws other people to us. And so be you and do you. The last thing I'll mention here, and I'm going to um, rely on our great global mentor, the wonderful uh, goat, Oprah Winfrey, who is my bestie, she just doesn't know it is uh, she has talked a lot about excellence and how excellence helped her to get ahead. Unfortunately, as a woman of color, I can, I can tell you, you don't have a choice but to be excellent, to be seen and heard. Now, the benefit is that when you have to re-audition for the role in the, again and again, you become excellent. And when your excellence is so excellent, it's like you're untouchable because people will like think they can test you. They think they can topple you. They think you, they can tear you down, but you're so excellent. It's like they catch a piece of you and they're like, okay, like I can't even like, I can't, in fact, I should just take a back seat and let her go and let her shine. So just, so be excellent. And the last thing I'll mention is I, I put out truckloads of videos on this, on empowerment. And so if you're watching and you think, oh my God, my kitty needs to hear this message, you can just go to RithyBasine.com. I have so many videos and blogs where I talk about empowering, empowerment, especially as a woman, especially as a woman of color on how to live better and do your best and be your best. 
So tell me about the authenticity principle, right? Like, uh, was there a moment that you decided, okay, I got to do this book? And what is the book designed to do? What's, what's your purpose? What's the message of, of, of the book, the project, all that's involved with what you put together uh, around uh, the authenticity principle? So good. And I should mention Eddie is in the authenticity principle. I interviewed him. And if you want to hear more about Eddie's story and how amazing he is, you should read my book. Just, just make it uh, be about Eddie because he's in it. So uh, thank you for being part of it and contributing. I'm grateful. So the authenticity principle is all about how we live in a society that is constantly like relentlessly pushing us to conform and conform to the dominant way of being. Like you think about racial supremacy, gender supremacy, and so much more, constantly pushing us to conform. And so that's a lot of us from a very young age receive this messaging. Yeah, who you are, especially what makes you different and unique. Don't do that. Don't be that. Conform. Push your differences down and be like us, i.e. the dominant culture, which is exactly what I did. And as I mentioned, like I suffered because of it. Like on the surface, it looked like things were going well because I was getting ahead and all like the materialistic external signals of, oh, she's thriving were there. But spiritually, in my soul, I felt vacant and empty and I wasn't thriving. And it was a, it was a number of things that, uh, that, that took place that led me to be in a place where I was like, F this, like, I'm, I'm going to change how I live my life. You can read that in the book. And by the way, um, I know that access is an issue. You can download the, the first chapter of the book for free at ridthoughthescene.com. Uh, and I, I, I talk a lot about authenticity in videos and blogs. So if you can't afford the book, no worries. The stuff is all free online. So um, I, uh, it was a number of things that got me there. And, but once I committed to it, and this is the piece, Eddie, that I think is so important. And, and like, I, I guess it would be like my final message to everyone is this, and, and, and it's being reinforced in this COVID moment. I committed to living as who I am. So I speak the way I want to speak. I say what I want to say. I dress the way I want to dress. I adapt my behavior and I talk about the importance of behavioral adaptations in the book. You can check that. Uh, so I do adapt. It's a choice when I do it and it feels good for me to do. And I'm, I'm about that, but really I'm, I'm, my focus in life is to be as authentic as possible. And, and here are two things that I think are interesting. Number one, it has set me free. So I am living my best now that I have ever lived before. And because I'm living my best and I feel so good about me, what I have noticed is I just radiate this energy. Like I'm not doing it deliberately, but we all radiate energy and it's like a magnet. And I feel like people are so much more drawn to me. I have more friends now than I did before. I was conforming and masking who I am so that people would be my friend. And now, that, and then I was like, F that, I'm just going to do me. And I have more friends, people. Pe more people like me. Why? Because I'm like, I don't give a fuck. And so on that note, segue into the second point. COVID is a reinforcement that we should not give a fuck. Like, this is the time to live our best life. This is the time to be who we are. This is the time to set ourselves free. If this is showing us anything on an individual level, it's the importance of being courageous and vulnerable and authentic because life is hard. And this is a moment where it's being revealed for us just how hard life is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll put a uh, disclaimer for the authenticity of... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, your, your sorry, ears. sorry, I didn't mean, mean to hurt your ears. I tried, I reined it in for 20 something, three minutes. And I was like, at the last five, I'm like, F that. Also, my authentic self is a cuss like a pirate. The adaptive self says don't. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, like you said, we need real. And if there is any time that people need to be real, it's the time in which, I mean, the uncertainty, the confusion, uh, there's enough of that out there and I just want people to know that when they call Eddie they can get it 100 and so I appreciate that and what I wanted to ask you as we get ready to go is what's on the horizon what's got cooking you had mentioned your website I want to ask you to do that again just let people know the ways that they can get a hold of you but yeah. also over the next 10 years what are you thinking what's what's what, what are you cooking what what you know you got something planned 
Oh, you know I do. You know I do, because can't stop, won't stop. Um, so first of all, uh, the best way to get a hold of me, and I know, know this is going to sound so silly, but it's to follow me on Instagram and DM me on Instagram. My response rate on Instagram direct messaging is 24 hours. If you email me, you're looking at about three weeks unless you're a client, in which case it'll be 24 hours. But everyone else, I'm like, see you in three weeks to four weeks. Anywho, but you can DM me on Instagram. Uh, you can go to rithubistine.com, lots of all that free information there. If you're wanting to learn more about us, you can, uh, from a client work perspective, you'd like to work with uh, me and my firm, you can go to basineconsulting.com. So that's how to get a hold of me. Um, in terms of what comes next, I have two book ideas. One I've started to write, the second one I am noodling now. And so there will be more books, there will be more videos, there will be more blogs, there will be more social awareness, self-reflection, empowerment tools coming out, uh, almost all of them free initially. And so there's lots of free stuff I have online. Uh, a podcast, I'm noodling a podcast. The more important thing about what's going to be coming from me to you is continued tools and strategies for how do we disrupt, how do we include, how do we be equitable, and how do we empower. I want us to live in more of a critically conscious way, and more of an equitable, equitable way, and more of an empowered way. And so all of what I'm going to do will be in furtherance of that. And have fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm a really fun person, Eddie. Fun. I do want to add a possible note of a project that we've been talking about that I found another scholar friend that is willing to join our forces. So I'll be in touch. We'll be in touch about that project. We won't put it out there right now because we don't want nobody to take that idea. But I just want to add that to your book list. Uh, one awesome. last thing. One last thing. Uh, we're yeah. asking people, what have you been watching? What have you been reading? What have you been listening to? Is there anything that you could add to our what to do while you're on COVID list uh, since folks have a little extra time on their hands? Yes, I, I love it. So, um, so first of all, listening to, I am, so my, my partner, my spouse, he is a musician. And so we have music going all the time. Uh, all kinds of music, Indian music, my favorite music in the whole wide world, which is soca music, which hails from Trinidad, the West Indies. Like I'm like a massive soca head. There's so much soca going at all times, but music from our, our, our music is always on. What I am watching, I just finished watching Ozark uh, season three. I loved it. Now I will say this. I have a rule. Um, you're going to love this Eddie and WPC. I have a rule that I only watch content that has diversity in it and, or, or, um, teaches around diversity and inclusion and uh, it, it's a pretty white show Eddie it's a, because it takes place in Ozark Missouri it is very white however the diversity element for me here was the ex well they had strong female leads characteristics that's diversity the other piece that was important for me though is it explores um, white Missouri Ozark culture and explores class class differences and there's some intersectionality. So um, I watched Ozark season three and I really liked it. But I'm looking for new content. So recommendations, please send me content ideas because there's not a lot of good critical shit online. Oh, sorry, I swore again. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm gonna close by giving you a couple that I've watched that you may have yeah. heard of, maybe you watched and you didn't think of these, but one is um, um, Little Fires Everywhere. I don't know if you've seen this. No. On Okay, you have got to see this show because I want to warn you. Is the, oh, is it on Hulu? I'm in Canada. We don't have Hulu, but I'll look it up. I'm going to write this down. Little yeah. Fires Everywhere. you got to find a okay. component. Little Fires yeah. Everywhere. This is, okay. in my opinion, being a fan of Kerry Washington and Reese Witherspoon, oh, yes. some of their best performance in their career. Okay. Uh, the other one on Netflix that I really enjoyed that... Um, um, you know, just taught me a different element of diversity that I was not so familiar with, uh, which is unorthodox. And it's a real look into the um, Jewish Orthodox community. And it's got a lot about uh, uh, gender, uh, class, uh, identity, authenticity. I mean, this is a movie, I think, uh, our TV show, I should say, that you, at least in my perspective, knowing you and your work, it'll really connect and resonate. So those are two I would give you. Um, Amazing. 
um, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, uh, but before we let you go, let me just say again, thank you for your ongoing support. Since we've met, um, you have always been supporting me and the conference, and I really appreciate that. And um, I'm looking forward to partnering, collaborating over the next few years. And next time I'm in Toronto, I'll have to hang out with you and the homie there, and we'll have to do some food, some soca, and some chilling. And uh, if you ever make it to Green Bay, you're always welcome here. But um, know whatever you got planned in the next 10 years, WPC, the Privilege Institute, we're with you. Thank you so much, Eddie. And thank you to you for continuing to support me. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of what you do at WPC. My first, you, you, you know this, because I say this whenever I'm on the stage there. The first WPC I attended, literally blew open my mind and transformed how I work and transformed my business. And so it was because of attending WPC. So I'm so grateful. Uh, watch out world for what we have coming up. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. You be good. Thank you. Take care. You too. Thanks. Bye everyone. Be well. Be well. Take care.